So we're recording. All right. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Megan and I am a diversity and adult services librarian at the Brampton Library and I'll in let my colleague Erin introduce herself. Hi, my name is Erin Walker and I'm the Makerspace and Digital Literacy Librarian at Brampton Library. Yeah, so thanks for joining us. Uh, before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that um, as Aaron and I are both uh, phoning in from Brampton, we would like to acknowledge that we're gathering here today on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and before them, their traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Huron, and Wendat. We also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and other global Indigenous people that now call Brampton their home. We are honoured to live, work, and enjoy this land. Uh, if you'd like more information uh, after the presentation, uh, just so you are aware, much of this workshop is based on the Serene Risk Cybersecurity 101 program. So there's a link right there at the bottom. Um, so this is a knowledge mobilization network created to empower Canadians to protect themselves from online threats and to reduce those risks through the distribution of knowledge. As you can see, we're going to, we have a lot of things on our agenda today. Um, we'll go through them and then there'll be times, I know we're a smaller group right now. So if you think of anything, I have you both muted, um, both, both of your participants muted. Uh, if you think of any questions that come to your mind as we're talking, just uh, go and put it in the chat. Um, and then if we're, talking and answering your question, you can unmute yourself. But the chat uh, is on the bottom right. If you see the little bottom chat bubble, you just click on that and post your question. To mute or unmute yourself, it's just at the bottom here. You see where there's a little microphone and a mute and you can choose to show your video or stop your video. That's up to you as well. Also, um, for those of you on WebEx, uh, you'll see on the bottom left, there's a the little closed caption icon. Um, and if you need that, you just click on it and the, the entire presentation can be uh, captioned for you. I, I know I mentioned this already to the participants here, but uh, just so any folks who are watching this on Facebook Live, uh, this recording will be available on our Facebook page afterwards and will also be, uh, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel as well after this. So you'll be able to, to, uh, to see it later. Um, also to, to leave the meeting, there's a red X on the bottom right. If you accidentally click that, you can just log right back into the meeting. That's no problem. Um, does anybody have any questions about using WebEx? No? Okay. All right, so let's get started. So the first thing uh, that you might be asking yourself when talking about cybersecurity is, are you at risk? And the simple answer is yes. You know, we all have risk. Cyber criminals don't just target celebrities or rich people. And it's not necessarily a single person sitting behind a computer screen either. Sometimes large companies collect your information without your knowledge, and they might use that to make money. I think Aaron's going to talk about that a little bit more later on. Um, but for example, if you use any of the things that are listed up here on this slide, you may have had your information stolen, your privacy violated, or your device used in ways that you would not agree to had you been aware of uh, you know, all of that fine print. And I know that that sounds really scary, or it can sound really intimidating, but we don't, we want to be sure that um, you're not scared off. We don't want to scare you from using the internet. Internet security or cybersecurity is all about managing risk. Using the internet, think about it like crossing the street. You shouldn't stop crossing the street, but it is important to be aware of the dangers and to look both ways. So today we're going to give you an idea of the things you should be looking for when you cross that cyber street, if you will. I want to talk about passwords first, um, because really they're essential to your cybersecurity. These days, an online account protected by a password is pretty much a necessity of life. And why are they so important? 
Well, passwords, they help you to prove your identity online and keep your information and your identity safe. Without a good password, especially on your most sensitive accounts, like your banking information or your Canada Revenue Agency account, for example, um, without that, it, it puts you at risk of having your money or even your identity stolen. And notice I said that a good password is necessary. It's really not enough to have any old common password. It needs to be good. So what does that mean? Well, a good password should be unique. It should be random. It should be long. And most importantly, it should be secret. Um, but also, it does need to be memorable to you. So let's get into it a little bit. So the reality is, knowing that, that all of that's important, and that's probably not new information, but most people are still using extremely simple passwords. Each year, Nor, NordPass, or sorry, NordPass releases an annual report on the top 200 most commonly used passwords. And according to their research in 2020, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, you heard me right. One, two, three, four, five, six took first place, which is used by more than 2.5 million people and exposed more than 23 million times in data breaches. And then in second place was, wait for it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And this was used more than 961,000 uh, by more than 961,000 people and exposed more than 7.8 million times in breaches. What's also interesting about this though, and maybe even more scary, is that um, this list also estimates how long it would take a hacker to crack them. And among the top, the 10 most common passwords that were used in 2020, eight of them would take a hacker less than one second to crack. When it comes to passwords, the best practice is to have a unique password for each and every account you use. I know that in practice, it's not always achievable or practical to do this, but please do make sure that your most sensitive and important accounts like your email, your banking, your social media accounts, make sure that they have unique and strong passwords and that these passwords are not reused with any other account and never share your passwords across categories of accounts. So for example, if you use online banking between two different banks, don't use the same password on both accounts. Okay, so how to make a secure password. This part isn't quite as obvious as it may seem. First of all, the length of your password exponentially increases the work that it takes a hacker to crack it. So just remember simply, the longer the better. Aim for 10 to 12 characters or more and avoid repeating sequential numbers or keyboard keys like we have listed here, one, two, three, four, five, or five, 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 because these are easy to enter and therefore they're commonly used, making them very vulnerable. So next, complexity is goal. Include a combination of symbols and lowercase and uppercase letters and numbers, which is something that you're often required to do when creating passwords for certain accounts anyways. But that said, the numbers and symbols that you use, or rather that you don't use, that does matter. So for example, do not use your birthday, do not use your anniversary, your house address, your pet's name, or any other details that could be linked to you. Erin is going to talk a little later um, about your online presence, but know that it's super easy for hackers to find out information about you. For example, they don't even have to hack into your social media account. They could hack into your friend's Facebook account and then look at your profile to find out things like your mother's maiden name, for example, or what date you wished your daughter a happy birthday and avoid words that can be found in the dictionary in any language. Instead, go for gibberish. Combine random words with no connection to you and substitute special characters for letters. So this is something that I really think is a, is a good uh, suggestion, using phrases. So phrases can be easier to remember than complex passwords. So one strategy is to take a phrase and turn it into a mnemonic password. So for example, we have a couple of examples up here. The first one, October 31st is Halloween. My favorite holiday will become the password, capital O, three, one, lowercase I, uppercase H, period, uppercase M, lowercase F, uppercase H, exclamation mark. 
you know, and then you have another one too. I'm allergic to peanuts, corn, and tomatoes. They give me a rash. This is a sentence that has meaning to you, but not necessarily meaning to others unless you've posted a lot about your tomato allergy. But avoid popular slogans, sayings, or music lyrics because these are things that are more universally uh, known. So something that a hacker might use to guess. Also, don't apply a pattern to your passwords, such as website name plus year, because should an attacker discover this pattern, all of your accounts then become vulnerable if you're using that same pattern. Even if it's different for every account, if you're using that same pattern for every account, um, then they just kind of have to figure out the password and it takes them a lot less time to figure it out. It's convenient. Um, to save your passwords as well in your browser, but really try to not do that. So keep your passwords in a secure place. I know that it can be really hard to remember and keep track of multiple passwords. If you must keep a list of passwords, do so offline in a secure, secret, and locked place. Don't make it obviously that, or don't make it obvious that it's a list of passwords. So um, for example, a notebook that's kept in a drawer that's away from your computer that's not listed passwords keeping it there is a good idea um, but don't put a post-it note on your computer that says passwords and a list of all of your passwords um, and don't keep a list of your passwords electronically as handy as that might be because you'd be using them on electronic devices um, you know, for example, don't email email yourself a list of all of your passwords or keep a text file or a spreadsheet. These are really, really easy for cyber criminals to steal, corrupt, or delete. And say no to password sharing. I know um, that there may be some people who are very trusted in your life, but it's important to keep your passwords private. You just never know um, how a hacker can get through to your passwords. You and only you should know your passwords, no matter how much you trust your loved ones, friends, or colleagues. Another tip um, is that you can, you can uh, add a second factor to the login process. This is known as a two-factor authorization or 2FA. In order to enable two-factor authentic uh, authentication, <laughs> That's a mouthful. You'll typically need to associate your cell phone with your account on the website. So you want to make sure that you have your cell phone with you. If you're a person that doesn't carry your cell phone everywhere, um, then that might not be the best option for you. But if you are, it's a really great uh, way to add that extra level of security. How you do that is each website will provide instructions, but it usually involves either entering your phone number or scanning a barcode with a special app. Then when you log on, the website will ask you for a code that they'll send to your smartphone. So yeah, again, this just adds an extra layer of security to your account and confirms that it's actually you who's trying to access it. 2FA provides a much better security than passwords alone, but keep in mind that not every website supports it. Password managers. So if you have difficulty um, accessing your passwords manually, you may want to consider using a password manager. Now, this is a software application that helps you securely store and organize your passwords. Um, and they're kept encrypted. So you'll have to create and use a master password to access your password vault. But the great part is that you will only have to remember a single password going forward instead of, you know, dozens or even hundreds, depending on how many accounts you have. Um, they're usually paid subscriptions, though there are a few uh, versions with limited features. But keep in mind that by using a password manager, you are accepting a little bit of risk still. It's not without vulnerable, vulnerable, sorry, again with the tongue twisters, vulnerable, okay, it's not without risk, <laughs> let's just say that. And should someone gain, um, you know, unauthorized access to your password manager, obviously that would be very bad. They also only have to guess one password to have access to all of your passwords. All right, so let's do a little bit of um, a present, or uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you guys a little bit. If you want to unmute yourselves to uh, answer this, can you tell me which of these passwords are most secure? So up here we have the 
uh, name of the person, Sandeep, Sandeep Singh. Um, they're a librarian. They live at 23 Chestnut Street, and their birthday is January 1st, 1982. Which of these passwords do you think is the most secure and which is the worst? Anyone venture to guess? Oh, I'm going to unmute. Uh, if you go to the bottom, yeah, there you go. The last one is the last two are good. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I agree with her. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I think the last two are good. Okay. For sure, fairly obvious. Yeah. So, so you're right that the first two are, um, they have a lot of personal information. Uh, pretty simple for a hacker to guess. The third one's also not great because it has uh, their their address on it, which is some information that a hacker could get. But it is well, it also has like information about library. It's not perfect. Really, the last one is what you want to go for um, because it's at first glance, even though it's based on a mnemonic memory device. So they use some sort of um, sentence in their head that is memorable to them, but then they've replaced it with random letters and characters that um, are, is meaningful to them. It really isn't meaningful to anybody else. So that fourth one really is the best. So I'm just gonna uh, mute you all again. So there's no feedback and we're gonna move on. Thank you. All right, so is this site secure? This is another important thing. You always wanna, if you look at the top left of your, um, the URL, so the URL is the address bar, um, you wanna look for that lock icon. So before entering your password or any other sensitive information on any website, such as your bank information, your credit card data, et cetera, look for that lock icon in the address bar. And if you don't see this icon, don't enter any information. The lock here means that the website you're using is encrypted, which is what we want. If you don't see it, the site you're communicating with may not be the intended website and your data isn't safe from being in intercepted. Does everybody uh, understand where you would see that? Just to the left of the URL address. Again, if you, for those who came late, if you have any questions, feel free to just type them in the chat and we'll get to them. And same with anybody who's looking on Facebook Live, you can just leave a comment on the video and, and we'll address it. All right, so tis the season for online shopping and Erin and I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. So again, you can unmute yourself to answer this question. Which of the following would compromise your security when online shopping? Saving your password on the website, saving your credit card information in the account, but your password is secure, shopping on a website that does not have a lock icon in the to the left of the URL, or all of the above. You can unmute yourself to guess, or you can type it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Can you repeat them? Sure. <laughs> oh, Erin, can you move to the next slide? Um, my website seems to have frozen. Okay. Well, Erin works. So if you can stop sharing and then reshare if you want, Erin, and I'll just I'll read them again. Um, okay, so which of the following would compromise your security when online shopping? Is it saving your password on the website, saving your credit card information in the account, but your password is secure, shopping on a website that does not have a lock icon to the left of the URL, or all of the above? All of the above. Yes. The lock icon, definitely. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 You're you're right. You're right. I it was kind of an easy one. Um, oh, and I see a comment. If we are accessing websites from cell phones, um, oh, that's a good that's a good question. Um, Aaron, maybe you can address this one. If we're accessing websites from cell phones, how can we make sure that they are secure? I don't see the lock icon. Oh, Erin, Erin is having such technical difficulties. Uh, let me let her in. Sorry, I'll address this question in just a moment. Um, okay, 
So Aaron is just going to reshare that, but we'll just talk uh, very briefly um, about uh, online shopping. And the answer is yes, of course, all of the above uh, compromises your security. So saving your password on the website, if a hacker gets into your computer, then they just you know, have to go to that website and then they can easily log in. Saving your credit card information in the account, but your password is secure. Um, again, as if they're able to crack the password somehow, then they have access to your credit card information. So it's best, I know it's annoying, but it's really best to just uh, to just put your, your information in every time. And then shopping on a website that does not have a lock uh, to the left of the URL also puts you at risk because it's not encrypted. So all of it is true. Um, Erin, yeah. are you there? Yes. Okay, so we have a question in the chat and I'm wondering if you're able to address it. It's a really good question. Um, if we're accessing websites from a cell phone, how can I make sure that they're secured if you don't see the lock icon? It's a good question. Um, so normally if you're accessing um, a website from a mobile device, depends if you're using a browser or an app, I would think. Um, if you're using a browser, you still get look um, lock icon um, in the web address. Um, and if you're using it, you're going to want to check uh, the privacy policy of the app before you install it. We're going to talk a little bit about installing apps um, later on in today's presentation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so there still would be, Erin, you were cutting out a little bit there, so I'm just going to repeat. Um, and I'm also going to ask everybody to turn off their videos because including myself, because that might help Aaron's um, connectivity if we all stop sharing our videos just at the bottom. Um, so again, if you're in your browser, then it should, uh, it, you'll still have in your browser and your cell phone, there will still be the lock icon on the URL. Um, and if it's through an app, Aaron's going to talk about security and when it comes to apps as well. Okay. Can I stop video, Nick? Uh, so you just have to press um, mute and then stop video at the bottom, which is right beside mute. Perfect. All right. So I think Aaron's having a little bit of technical difficulties. So I'm just going. Yeah, I'm just going to open the um, the presentation so that I can share it. Yeah, my web is having issues today. It yeah, keeps... sorry, folks, for the technical difficulties. We'll be with you in just a second. Um, Does anybody have any other questions um, while I'm just opening this? All right, let me address this. Can you say that again? I have a question. Okay. Password storage. Um, on my file and computer, store on Word, my Word file, I made a note of the password rather than keep it on a piece of paper tucked in a drawer somewhere. Um, is that okay? I mean, they can't get in my computer without the Apple password. So the best thing to do is to secure your passwords in an offline location. So put them in a notebook and put them like in a dresser or something like that. Um, because if they just, if they're able to hack into your computer somehow, then they could potentially find that. Okay. So even on that word file, just get rid of it, right? Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So aren't any um, other questions? I'm going to go ahead to the next uh, section, which is we're gonna talk about email. All right. So there is no security system inherent in email. You wanna treat all emails with a healthy dose of suspicion. So there's no surefire way to tell if the identity of the sender and the content of the email is legitimate we really have to be careful. All the elements of an email can be faked or manipulated. Emails that you send, um, emails that you send are not secured and can be read or altered in transit. So what are some of the threats associated with email we might ask ourselves? Let's just talk about how we can mitigate these risks. 
All right, so junk and spam mail. So most junk and spam mail, I'm sure you've gotten lots of it. Most of them are benign, but some can be malicious. A lot of this email is filtered by your email provider into a junk or a spam folder. So you wanna check your spam folder periodically in case legitimate emails that you want to receive are inadvertently filed there. If spam email creeps into your inbox, you use your email provider's report spam feature. So I'll show you where that is here. If you just, um, so this is an example from Gmail, but others are quite similar. There's this uh, little, it looks like a stop sign sort of with an exclamation mark, and that's where you can go to report your spam. Uh, you just click on whatever it is and report it that way. You can also report spam to fightspam.gc.ca. This is a Government of Canada website, and there's also a lot of good information there as well. All right, so um, Aaron, are you able to take over with attachments? I think you're muted. I don't know if you're trying to talk, Aaron. Okay, I think Aaron's having technical difficulties, so. I'm just going to continue on. Um, so attachments are files that are attached to an email. So they're usually marked with a paper clip icon and some attachments uh, may contain viruses or other malware. We've often heard of people opening a malicious email attachment and then their computer gets compromised. And that's another reason why um, it's important to not be sure. Um, storing your passwords on your computer because it could be something as simple as that, that you accidentally click on a poor attachment and then that person has access to all of your information on your computer. Erin, are you with us? Did you want to take over? Uh, yeah, just give me one second. I just came on a different device. No problem. I'll, I'll continue with attachments and you just tell me when you're ready. All right. Um, so malware is short for malicious software. It's a blanket term for viruses. Trojans and other uh, harmful computer programs that hackers use to gain access to sensitive information or hold your computer hostage. Keep in mind that even files that look perfectly harmless and open as you would expect can contain dangerous code that ruins the background on your device without you even knowing it. So, um, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I know Facebook is a a big risk site mm -hmm. and I ended up opening something that I actually did think a friend sent to me and then what ended up happening was that same message was sent to all of my or not yes. all the majority of people in my Facebook yes so I found it you know discovered it right away so I went in and used my password and all that but it's like because of that do they have access to all of my stuff um Aaron, maybe you have another uh, more information, but my uh, I think it really depends on the type of scam that it is. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. I, I have seen that same Facebook message scam before. I've received it from people as well. Um, usually, what happens is you'll get a Facebook message saying, um, "Click this link," and we're going to talk about links, um, or we just talked about links. Um, the link will actually bring you to a website and ask you to enter your credentials. And it looks like Facebook, but it's not Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually um, collecting your login information. So the best thing to do if you if you have actually um, clicked on that link and did enter your credentials because you believe you were logging into Facebook would be to change your password immediately um for all of your accounts especially any accounts that use the same email um, address as your Facebook account and particularly if you use the same password across accounts okay does that answer your question Jackie yes absolutely yeah I changed my password right away but I didn't know if there's anything else I needed to hmm. yeah yeah we're going to talk a little bit about social media um and later on in the presentation today all right, Megan, did you want to take over from here? Yeah, sure. So I'll just, um, I finished with that slide. So I'm going to move on to how to spot malicious attachments if you want to take over from there. Perfect. Thank you, Megan. Mm -hmm. So it's important to know that when it comes to attachments, 
A malicious attachment may come from an unknown person or from someone that you know and trust who may have inadvertently sent one to you if they themselves have had their computer compromised. Um, so when you're looking at an attachment, consider if the attached file is something that the sender created themselves. So is it a video um, of a birthday party that they took themselves that they're sending you? Or is it something that's been forwarded from an unknown originator? So be really careful opening files if you can't determine where it originated. This is especially important um, around these times um, when a lot of people are sharing and forwarding um, videos about um, health tips in the pandemic, COVID information, vaccine information. This, this type of information is very vulnerable to having um, malicious um, programs embedded within it. Um, so also be careful with those funny cat videos. Um, we all like to watch them, um, but you're safer to watch them through a link on YouTube than a video that's been attached um, to your email. Um, sometimes the video itself is fine, but the video is also um, comes with another attachment that you might inadvertently click on and install a program you did not want on your computer. So when you're dealing with attachments, Pay special attention to the file name or the extension as well as the type of file. Always be suspicious of file names that are not within the norm of what you might expect to receive from someone. Um, be, be suspicious of files that have spelling errors or um, are attached with a strange combination of letters and characters. You should never open an exe file that's attached to an email. Exe files are executionable files and they're notorious for being able to install malicious code on your computer. And also be on the lookout for that .exe embedded within a file name. This is often a way people get tricked. So you might receive a file called um, birthdayphoto.exe.jpg. And we might just, you know, glaze over that exe and just see the JPEG and think, oh, it's just a photo. Um, this is a track that many hackers use to get you to click on um, what you might easily mistake as an ordinary photograph being attached. Um, when it comes to ordinary office documents like Excel or Word files, proceed with caution. Um, these can also contain hidden macros or scripts that can run after you launch the file. Um, and if you ever see an M appended after a recognizable extension, um, so for example, like a doc M or an XLS M, um, these are macro files and you should be aware of them. All right. So where can we find the file extension? Um, these are always appended at the, on your email, usually at the bottom of the message itself. And you should be able to see um, the type of file that is attached um, at the last three characters of the file name. Okay. So links and emails. So we just touched on this very briefly. I'm going to go into this in more detail. Um, links and email are also very vulnerable. Um, and you want to be aware of phishing links in particular. Um, always treat links and email that are asking for personal information or a login or to verify um, account information with extreme suspicion. Your personal information is extremely valuable to cyber criminals. Uh, in particular, your account login information, so those usernames and passwords, uh, financial information, um, social, social insurance number, all of that information is very valuable to criminals. So because of this, they put a lot of effort into trying to trick you into giving that valuable information to them. Uh, and these efforts are what we would call as phishing, so as in phishing for personal information. Phishing emails often appear to be from an organization with which you have done some business with or that you're a customer of. Um, they often contain a link to a page where you can log in or enter account credentials on the pretext of checking, verifying, or updating your account. So always treat links to websites that ask for this type of personal information or a login through a link with extreme suspicion. So simply avoid clicking on links and emails, particularly if it's from a company that you do business with. 
if you receive an email and uh, you want to check whether or not there's an issue with your account, you can always go to the website in the usual way. Open up a browser, type in you know Netflix.com or Amazon.com in the usual way, or you can always call the organization and verify that they in fact do need this information confirmed. Most of the time, um, companies will not email you to confirm account information as a rule. The problem with emails, as Megan mentioned, is that anything can be faked. So there is a problem that um, occurs with email called spoofing. So a spoof email looks like a legitimate email from someone you know or a company that you do business with. And it's commonplace for spam and phishing emails to use spoofing to trick you into trusting the origin of the message. And when it comes to links, not just in emails, but in general, what you see is not always where you go. So one of the best defenses against clicking on something that's potentially dangerous is to simply hover over the hyperlink in question prior to clicking. If you find yourself questioning the link in an email, hovering over the link will reveal that URL. It'll pop up in a little um, overlay and reveal the, the address that that link actually directs to. So here on the screen is a very common phishing attempt from cyber criminals pretending to be Netflix. This one circulated widely and, and still does. Um, you can see that it looks like it's an email that came from Netflix and you're asked to click the link to log in and validate your payment information. And if you don't, they threaten to suspend your account. This is highly suspicious. So let's look at it a little bit more closely and see how easy it is to be duped if we're not careful. So here in the sender field, we can see that it says it came from customer.support at netflix.com. Okay, seems legitimate. If we hover over that link, we'll see that it directs to a website that you might also think is legitimate. It uses what we would call a lookalike URL. It has netflix.com in it, um, but it's actually not a, a legitimate link. It will take you to a fake Netflix webpage that looks very much like the real thing, very difficult to tell whether or not it's legitimate or fake. Uh, and it will ask you to enter in your login and your billing address and credit card information. And the problem with this is once that fake page is filled out, it redirects to the real Netflix homepage. So you have no idea that you've actually just given all of this um, personal information, sensitive information um, to cyber criminals who can then use that to um, compromise your credit card, um, steal your identity, or access other accounts that you may use that have the same uh, credentials. So how else can we spot some malicious links? Um, some other suspicious signs include an obvious misdirection. So again, if we hover over that link and it doesn't match who the sender claims to be. Um, a lot of cyber criminals, as, as good as they are at making fake fakes look real, sometimes they're pretty sloppy and it's quite obviously not linking to the web page it claims to be. Um, anytime you see a link um, that is linking to an IP address, so something like uh, some numbers, 67.227.211, et cetera, um, that's, that's also a huge red flag. A legitimate site will always have um, a named text link. And be careful with links to foreign domains, um, particularly destinations that end in .ru or China, as well as others. Um, ask yourself, is the sender that this email claims to be from based in that country? Um, and if the answer is no, it's highly likely that it is um, a scam email. So speaking of scams, there are other risks related to email that you may have come across. Um, remember that email can, sent, can be sent to anyone from anywhere in an automated fashion, but it can appear to be from someone you know. So there are a few types of common email scams um, we'll just touch on briefly. Um, some of the most common ones you may come across. The first is the advanced fee fraud. This is sometimes called the 419 scam. Uh, and this 419 refers to the criminal code that outlaws the practice in Nigeria, which is where many of these scams originate. 
though they can come from any country. Um, someone from overseas offers you a share in a large sum of money or a payment on the condition that you help them transfer money out of the country. And the scammers may ask for your bank account details to, quote, help them transfer the money to you and then use this information to later steal your funds. Or they might ask you to pay fees, charges, or taxes to help release or transfer the money out of the country. Um, but of course, you'll never see that money that you've been promised. Lottery and sweepscape scams are also um, very common. Um, you might get an email informing you you are the winner of a large lottery or sweepstakes. And before receiving any winnings, you'll be asked to pay an upfront processing fee um, or courier fee or tax. Um, and of course, the payments of your winnings is never sent. And if you do send them that money, it's gone. Um, this is also becoming more frequent on social media. So be aware of it um, on Instagram in particular. Um, you might receive a message saying that you entered a contest. And that account might actually be um, a copycat account of a contest you actually entered. And sometimes people are tricked into giving away their information uh, in the same way. So um, you may say, oh, congratulations, you are the winner of this Instagram contest. Um, please confirm your details in this web form. But it is, in fact, not the actual um, originator of the contest. They're just stealing your information. The last uh, email scam that's also very common and also really concerning is the emergency scam. Um, and a lot of seniors are particularly at risk for this and have fallen victim to this. Uh, so a scammer may pose as a relative or a friend, um, such as a grandchild, uh, emailing you to um, wire them money immediately. Um, they'll say they need cash to help with an emergency, like getting out of jail, um, paying a hospital bill, or needing to leave a foreign country quickly. Um, and they'll often claim to be embarrassed by what has happened and will ask you to keep this a secret from other family members. Uh, and many fail to verify the story with other family or friends until it's too late and the money has been sent. Uh, and like I said, this often targets grandparents and these scammers play upon the emotions uh, to rob people of their, of their money. In general, when it comes to email, always be suspicious of the following. Um, if you receive an email that doesn't address you by your name, uh, ones that use generic greetings like dear madam or sir or dear friend, um, emails that appear to be from someone you know, but the, the tone, the, the language used doesn't quite sound like them. It uses terminology that they would never use. Um, if you're at work and someone from your organization who would not normally email you, um, sends you an email and asks you to do something. Um, ask yourself, would the CEO of my company be asking me to perform this task? Is that something that would normally happen? And if the answer is no, um, that's probably um, a spoofed email. Always be suspicious of any emails that request you to confirm or verify account information or credentials or payment information. Um, another huge red flag are emails that require urgent or immediate action. Um, this sense of urgency is a way scammers trick you into replying without thinking. Another red flag are emails that contain misspelled words, sloppy grammar, or odd word choices, especially from uh, emails pretending to be a legitimate business. So ask yourself, you know, would Netflix send me an email with a spelling error or, you know, a grammatical error? Is that something that they are likely to do? Probably not. And of course, always be wary of emails that ask you to send money to Western Union, MoneyGrams, um, or ask you to purchase prepaid credit cards or gift cards. So here's actually an example of one that I received recently from my father-in-law. Um, so I threw it in here as an example. Um, now, right away for me, a red flag was the happy in brackets day of the week. So obviously this email had been automated in some way and that day of the week should have been filled in with say happy Friday, if it had been a Friday. Um, the email address, um, when I hovered over it, was correct. It was coming from my, my father-in-law's actual email address. Um, but the tone of it seemed off. Um, first of all, he would never email me out of the blue like this. 
uh, and it wouldn't be so cryptic. So he says, hello, where are you? Are you busy? I need a little favor from you. Um, so I knew right away that my father-in-law uh, email address had been hacked uh, and we contacted him right away. Unfortunately, um, some of his contacts in his email had fallen for this, had replied, and were engaging with a hacker. Um, the hackers were asking them to um, send money uh, or purchase uh, Apple iTunes gift cards in various amounts and, and send them the um, the confirmation numbers for that. So it's very easy for people to be duped. All right, so let's have a little discussion. Um, your good friend sends you an email titled forward, 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 fun cat video with an attachment. How would you handle this? Contact the friend and ask them if they sent the video. Yep, you could do that. Just ignore them. Don't yeah, <laughs> you can just ignore them. That's a good thing too, obviously. So a few other things, you could look at the file attachment, see if it's actually attached as a, a video file, so like an MPEG. Um, but the safest thing to do is just ignore it and delete it. Um, and if your friend asks you about it, you can you can just say, oh, I might have accidentally deleted it. Um, but yeah, you should definitely be careful with those forwards where you, you cannot determine where it actually originated from. You mentioned delete. What if you just leave it after ignoring it? Any potential problems from that? If you just delete it? If you didn't delete it, you just ignored it. You, ignored you would just it. ignore it. It's just going to clutter up and take up space in your inbox. Oh, okay. But yeah, the, the safest just thing know. is just to get rid of it. Yeah. I have a question. What about the funny videos that like forward, forward, forward within the WhatsApp or other apps, not only by emails? Can we get hacked um, or viruses so if we're opening this on phones? It depends. If it's linking to say a YouTube, that would be safer because that video is also actually being hosted on YouTube or Vimeo or whatever video um, hosting site is, is being used. If it's actually um, an attachment, you want to be careful with those um, for the same reasons that we've discussed. So it might have something embedded in it that could infect your device. So the, the is there any, I'm sorry, is there actually like antivirus system on cell phones installed or like? I know that on computer you have this antivirus and like whatever you open if your antivirus is good so like it will catch up but is there on phones i believe there are but you would need to check for your particular type of device so if you have an android or an ios um there are there are products that you can invest in that should protect your device i can't speak to any particular ones and i'm going to be talking uh a, a little later about um apps and and securing your apps as well. Okay. I think the important thing with um, these type of attachments is just to recognize that your your friend is not intentionally trying to infect your computer. They may be inadvertently sending you something that they really did watch and think was funny uh, or brighten your day. Um, so no one intentionally sends things. I receive these types of videos all the time from my family members. Um, I just gently ask them, you know, hey, if you could find a link to this on YouTube, I'd be happy to watch it. But um, I'm probably not going to to click on that attachment and, and watch it just because I want to keep my system uh, safe. All right. All right, um, another question. What would you do if you received an email from your bank asking you to confirm all of your banking information? No way. Yeah. <laughs> no so you call your bank and let them know um, that this is happening so that they can alert other customers. But yeah, absolutely never um, enter any banking information uh, online in this manner. Great. All right, let's talk a little bit about privacy. Um, so a few things have come up related to social media, but let's start with search engines. So I've got a few different search engines up on the slides here. 
Um, are any of these familiar to you? Which do you use? Google. Google, yeah. You used to use Yahoo. But yeah. Google and Yahoo. Yeah, so Google and Yahoo. Google is definitely ubiquitous. It's it's the default one that we all go to, and it's good. It's a it's a decent search engine. It, it gets the job done, of course. But when it comes to um, Google and other browsers, the truth is it's almost impossible to browse the internet securely and privately. Um, anytime you visit a website, you leave a trail of data behind you. And you can't stop all of it. Um, it's just how the internet works. Um, you're always going to have, to some degree, a digital footprint. But there are plenty of things that you can do to reduce that footprint. So I'm sure um, some of these um, scenarios on the screen have happened to you. So you've been browsing an online store only to have the items you're looking at pop up in an ad on another website or on your Facebook page. Right? That's happened yeah. to all of us. Um, <laughs> Have you ever searched for something in a search engine and then suddenly had ads popping up, say, in your email account or on other websites related to that? Yeah, yeah. all the time. Yeah. They know what we're searching for and they're trying to target us because they want us to click and purchase products. We are we are the product when we're on the Internet. So one of the things you can do, um, particularly if you're using Google and you have a Google account and you're using Google Chrome and the um, Google search engine, is to take over control of your Google's tracking habits through the activity controls page in your Google account. Um, now, the way you access these settings can change, so they don't make it easy on you. Sometimes they change the terminology or the location where you get into that. Uh, but you're usually going to find it under manage your Google account. And then currently it's under privacy and personalization. And then there's the um, web and app activity section that you want to be particularly pay particular attention to. So here you can see everything that they're tracking and you're able to toggle or delete um, anything you're uncomfortable with. So such as your location or your search history, that kind of thing. That's good to know here. You, so yeah, take, spend some time and get familiar with those settings and just make sure, you know, knowledge is power. Being aware of how you're being tracked might also influence the activities that you partake in online or the way that you use the internet. Um, you can also make adjustments to your web browser. So um, Google Chrome is pretty common these days. Most people are using it. Um, and of course, you know, it's just available and easy. Um, and in normal mode, the Google Chrome browser collects data about your online activity all the time. Um, when you use a regular browser tab, all the information about the websites you visit, the pages you open, what you search, all of this information is added to the user profile or your digital footprint. If you don't want Google Chrome to remember your activity, um, particularly if you're using, say, a, a public or a shared computer, um, you can opt to use incognito mode. You can manually open an incognito, incognito mode tab, and it will look like this. Uh, or you can open one with a keyboard shortcut, which is Control Shift N. You'll see that black browser window pop up, letting you know you're in incognito mode. Incognito mode um, helps when you don't want other users uh, who are using the same computer to know um, where you've been searching or where you've been. And it can somewhat help protect you from some forms of third party tracking that websites use. But it's important to acknowledge that it doesn't guarantee full protection from tracking and the actual privacy benefits you get from this mode are limited. The data still continues to flow to Google Analytics. It's just that Google doesn't link it to your particular user profile. Now, when it comes to privacy in search engines, Google is, of course, convenient and ubiquitous, but as Google users, we are essentially signing over all of our web data to Google. There are alternatives, however. Um, one that is often um, recommended is a search engine uh, called DuckDuckGo. And this particular search engine is built a good name around protecting users' privacy. It doesn't collect personal information, it doesn't store search history, and it doesn't sell 
information about its users to advertisers, though you will see, still be exposed to advertisements on the site. That's how it operates. They just won't be targeted as targeted as they would be uh, with Google or other search engines. All right, so let's chat a little bit more about privacy and social media. So social media is great. It helps you connect with your friends, your family. You can share interests with others, catch up on the latest news. But social media can also put your safety and your privacy at risk because you are sharing personal information online when you use many of these websites or apps. This is why it's critical to be careful about the information you put online and to become familiar with your privacy settings and limit the information or the type of information that you share on social media. So just like Google, I encourage you to become familiar with the privacy policies of the social media platforms you use or want to join. Uh, and understanding these policies will help you to make more of an informed decision on whether or not you'd actually like to sign up or continue using some of these social media applications. So I'm gonna focus on Facebook, um, but this could apply to any social media application that you may be using. Um, like I mentioned, um, find out to how to adjust your privacy settings and customize them so that information is shared only in the ways that you want it to be. Um, you should review and update these settings regularly um, because um, most annoyingly, social media sites are always changing how you access them and the terminology they use for them. Um, so make sure you're, you're always aware of where you get into those settings and how you can change them. And the truth is managing these can be time consuming and annoying, but it is really important to review these settings regularly if you're concerned about your privacy. If privacy is really important to you, um, you can always choose the highest and most restrictive settings available. Um, don't feel that you need to give out information like your phone number, your birthday, your address, and your location. You can enter um, fake information or simply leave fields like that blank. Um, and some people even, even prefer to use a pseudonym on social media sites and apps um, to protect their privacy. But remember that privacy settings are not a silver bullet for protecting your privacy online, um, but they can and they should help you increase your control over how your personal information is handled and viewed online. But even if you think your priv privacy settings on a social networking site like Facebook are completely locked down, that you have complete control over who can access and view your content, you should still never post anything that you wouldn't want the whole world to see. Um, anything you post online can potentially be captured by someone uh, who could screenshot it and repost it elsewhere or share it in other ways. And remember, of course, that regardless of the audience that you choose to allow to see your Facebook, piece for, Facebook posts, for example, um, Facebook or the other social media accounts are still collecting information or data on everything that you post. Um, so you might delete something or choose to hide something, but that data still persists in different places and removing it permanently can be really difficult, if not impossible. So always think twice or thrice before you post something uh, on a social media site. Erin, there was a chat or um, a question that just came in the chat box about Eventbrite collecting personal information. So, so Eventbrite it definitely collects personal information, um, but Eventbrite also has a privacy policy that stipulates how they manage that data and what they do with it. Um, so that's something you can always view and see if you agree with um, the policy that they have. Um, so you can find out if Eventbrite is, if you're by using Eventbrite, if you are agreeing to allow them to sell the information, for example. Uh, I'm not sure of the particulars. I haven't actually done a deep dive into that privacy policy, but that's really something you should do with any website or app that you're using um, that's collecting your personal information if you're concerned. So sorry for interrupting you. I, I just want to uh, 
uh, confirm something with this event, right? So, for example, when you're registering for some uh, sessions, right? Eventbrite, they just asking basic questions, right? Your email and your name. Yes. But for some events, it looks like it's requirement of organizer, and they're yeah. starting to collect like your address and like how many people will be watching. Especially, it comes when I'm registering my kids for some classes, so they asking like what school, what ages, names, and other stuff. So. I feel a little bit hesitant about all this data collection with Eventbrite. So, yeah. um, do you know anything that you can add to this? It like um, so how this data shared or so it's up to you what you decide to share online. So, um, if an Eventbrite registration is asking for that information, the first thing um, I would want to verify is how is the organizer going to use that information. So, has the organizer included? Um, a statement around the collection of personal information. So many library programs, for example, we would include a statement saying we are collecting this information um, as under the authority of the Public Libraries Act, and it will only be used for the purposes of administering um, programming, for example. Um, other organizations may have similar statements that they include. Um, you can always enter, um, you know, information that's fake. So you could put in a fake address. You can put in um, information that is not correct or true. If you feel that, um, you know, if it's a required field, that's something you can do. Um, there's no rule that says you have to enter everything exactly as it is. Um, particularly if, you, if you're not aware how it's going to be used or shared. Um, and with anything, there's always going to be um, a degree of trust that we give for the convenience of using some of these online applications. Um, that's just the way it goes with using, um, you know, social media or other apps. Um, you're giving up a little bit of your of your privacy. There's some risk involved always when you're sharing anything online, um, but you have to decide for yourself what your threshold is for that. Um, and that's why reading up on privacy policies or asking organizations um, how your information is going to be collected and shared or reshared is really important. So, um, does that does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, I'm going to continue on. Um, just talking more a little bit more about privacy on social media. Um, really important note is that even if you wish to share information about yourself online, be sure not to share too much information about other people, especially minors or children. Um, you should always consider the privacy of others and get consent before you share um, a photo of someone else or other personal information. Because um, when you post about friends or family and tag them in images or posts, that affects their privacy too. Um, so it's a good practice when posting photos of other people. Ask ask yourself if it's appropriate, or better yet, get permission from that person. Say, hey, do you mind if I share this photo? Um, and consider if there are going to be any other potential negative consequences. Um, I just want to apologize for the background noise. I can't mute myself because I'm sharing my screen and we have our toddler home today. So just ignore all the squeals in the background. <laughs> Um, so, for example, on the screen, this is something you probably would never post. Um, I'm so proud of my daughter, Jane Smith. She's only 14, attends Brampton High School. She'll be walking home alone today along the river path. Obviously, this is an exaggerated example, but there's all sorts of information on there that you probably wouldn't want widely shared. All right. Um, here's another um, problematic aspect of social media that you might not have considered. Um, be aware of fun Facebook quizzes, um, such as this, this one's what's your elf name? Um, you know, these look like harmless fun, um, but beware that posting your answers to these quizzes can leave you vulnerable to identity theft or fraud. Um, and this is because these types of quizzes ask you the same questions that um, your bank or other financial organizations use for security purposes to verify your identity when you need to change your password or access your account without a password. So these quizzes get you to reveal details that um, 
that your bank might ask to verify your identity or that you yourself might incorporate into your passwords. As we mentioned off the top, a lot of people, um, you know, use information that's easily identifiable to them and easy for them to remember, like their birth date or their birth month and incorporate those into passwords. Uh, so by watching your social media, a hacker could learn these details about you if you are in the habit of responding to these types of quizzes, along with other information that you might be posting. And they could use this information to um, steal your identity, um, to open up accounts in your name or worse. All right. So obviously we can express ourselves freely online, but we always wanna be considerate when it comes to sharing in public and semi-public online um, environments. Um, so just as I mentioned before, your online activity affects your security and privacy, as well as the privacy of others. Um, so you always want to take care and consideration to reduce the risks of harm. So can you think of a few other examples of things you probably shouldn't share online or in social media? If you're going to be away for holidays. Yes, very good. Excellent. Yeah, you wouldn't want to post um, those vacation photos while you're on vacation, this alerts everyone that you're not home. Very problematic, but something that we all, we all have done. Or there's, there's that app, um, I can't remember the name of the app, but where people will post, I'm here at this restaurant. Uh, oh, Square, or I forget what it's called now, they changed the name, yeah. Also, yeah, yeah. Kind, of, kind of like WhatsApp, but basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm here with so and so and so and so. <laughs> yeah, very problematic giving away your location. Yeah, those are both great examples. And of course, there are many others. All right. Um, just one last tip before I hand things back over to Megan. Um, this is a, a cybersecurity tip that most experts um, do in practice and, and highly recommend. And it's simply to cover your webcam. This is because it's really easy to um, accidentally um, have malware installed in your computer by various reasons that we've discussed, like clicking a bad link or opening a bad attachment. And you know this can give um, a cyber criminal access to your computer. Um, so this will let them see what you do, access your files, and most uh, alarmingly, activate the camera and microphone. So that is super creepy. So covering the webcam when you're not using it just ensures that no one can see into your home, to your personal space, and guarantees a very minimum level of privacy. Um, and you'll see that this is something that most tech, ex tech experts do in practice. Um, Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, um, former FBI director James Comey, um, and others have famously been photographed with you know, a piece of tape over their computer's camera when it's not in use. Uh, if you're using an external webcam, so one that just plugs into your computer through a USB port, the simplest thing you can do is only connect it when it's in use. If you don't need it, unplug it. And on a similar note related to this, um, this is a common scam email that you may have come across. Um, I know my uh, family have received this and were quite alarmed. Um, you might receive an email that suggests uh, a sender quote unquote knows what you have been doing on the internet and threatening to share vi video evidence of you in a uh, sensitive activity um, captured on your webcam unless you pay them a large sum in Bitcoin or gift cards. These are called sexploitation scams and you should just ignore them. Um, you'll notice that they often cite a password that you actually use or did use uh, and this is what alarms people. Um, but this is always because or most likely because um, a website or an app that you use suffered a data breach so that those credentials were were stolen. Uh, so this is also a really good reminder to change your passwords frequently and don't use um, the same one for all of your online activities. All right, so I'm going to pass things back over to Megan. Um, unless there were any other questions, I'm not able to see the chat at the moment. I have a question. Josh. Okay. Um, 
You know when you see stuff on, on Facebook that uh, like an event is happening and you click if you're interested or not? I don't know. Um, is that a bad thing to do too? I figure if I click interested, then at least I'm going to get a link to the event. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's an example where you would um, assess the level of risk with that. Are you concerned with everyone who can see your Facebook activity um, being aware that you might be attending this event? Is that something you're concerned about? Um, it could be risky. It might not be risky, but you have to make a choice whether or not you're comfortable with other people being aware of that information. Um, now, there may be a Facebook setting that lets you um, only have that activity viewable to you alone and no one else. Um, so Facebook is always changing their privacy settings. So there are some things on Facebook that only you can see. You can set the the view settings to only me. And maybe that's something you'd want to do. But it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis. I'm not sure um, off the top of my head without looking at it um, whether or not that applies to um, responses to events on Facebook or not. Does that answer your question? I'll take that as a yes. I'm going to go forward. All right. So um, installing apps or software, I know we had a question about this. Um, uh, so hopefully this will give you some more insight. All right. So applications are what may, or apps, as we often uh, refer to them as, um, they're really what make computers or, or tablets or smartphones great. But of course, they can cause problems. So First of all, you want to be sure to install only the programs that you need, only the programs that you're using. Install new applications only from trustworthy sources, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. And read the screen prompts, or otherwise known as the dialog boxes, carefully when you're uh, installing it and getting the tour of the new app. Do look for software from legitimate sources and read everything carefully during the installation process. Me with the tongue twisters today, let me tell you. Reduce the risk of flaws on your system by uninstalling software that you no longer use, you no longer need, or is no longer being updated by the manufacturer. You also want to uninstall old apps that you don't use. So uh, learn how to uninstall applications that you're no longer using. It's different for different devices, uh, whether you're using Android or a tablet, but you could uh, look that up online uh, using whichever search browser or search engine you like to use. Um, software that's out of date can be a target for hackers to gain access to your system. And that's because uh, if they're they're updated regularly, they're usually already installed with uh, secure, security um, measures. So more about installing apps. Uh, so mobile apps prompt you to give them permissions to access contacts and to use the camera, the microphone, like the geolocation and all of that information. Some apps really can't work without these permissions, but some use this information to profile you for marketing or worse. Um, so, reading the information and screen prompts presented at installation can alert you that a piece of software presents a risk to your privacy. So, for example, you might give a weather application access to your location, and this is necessary because it really should know where you are in order to provide appropriate information. But you would probably choose not to install a weather application that wants to access your microphone or your contacts. It shouldn't have any reason uh, for you to need that information, for you to be able to use the device, that information would only be for its own benefit. In terms of installing software only from trusted sources, the best places is, are just to go to um, the Google Play Store if that's for, if you're on an Android or your App Store if you're on an Apple device. Um, so take steps to minimize the chance of installing poor quality software by doing this. Downloading software from other sites, particularly those advertising a large amount of free software, can be risky as the site operator is probably not monitoring the quality and content of these applications. 
And installing illegal versions of software is even more risky as these applications are often implanted with malware or at the very least are cut off from the manufacturer's updates that keep the software safe. So that's what it's talking about. The manufacturer automatically has updates um, and that keeps your software safe. So most software is designed to be updated or patched regularly to improve it and revenue security holds. So updating your apps and also keeping your device updated regularly greatly increases the security of that computer or that device. All right, so um, antivirus and security software. This is think of it like locks on your doors and bars on your windows. They don't guarantee security but they do increase it. So no antivirus or security software can provide total protection, but there are a number of choices when it comes to security software. Be aware that many of the applications that claim to be antivirus software um, are actually scams or viruses themselves. So threats and malware on the internet change constantly. Your security software should adapt and defend properly against them and will need to be updated frequently. So again, you're probably hearing a pat pattern, which is update, update, update. Update your apps regularly when they need it. Update your devices regularly anytime uh, an update is ready. Do it right away. So, um, that brings us around to almost the end, but we wanted to give you all some more learning resources. Now I can send you these last couple of slides where to learn more, but bramptonlibrary.ca, so that's the Brampton Library's website. Under the e-learning tab, you can go to lynder.com and there's lots of video tutorials, um, courses even you can take on privacy. Just go into that app uh, you access with your library card and search privacy. Um, and then here's a bunch of other resources as well where you can learn more about, about cybersecurity and how to make yourself uh, uh, more secure online. All right. And then um, the Ryerson Security uh, Cybersecure uh, Catalyst is also uh, another great learning resource as well. Um, and Erin, did you want to talk about um, the DMZ Can Hack 2021? Yeah, um, this is um, a program that the Library is participating in this year. It's a cybersecurity competition for high school students. Um, there is a gamified uh, challenge that takes place over two weeks in March, and teams can join a team and um, learn about a variety of security uh, topics like reverse engineering, um, cryptography, um, binary exploitation, really high level stuff um, that will prepare them for um, potentially a career in cybersecurity. Um, it's hosted by Ryerson DMZ, um, but Brampton Library is currently organizing teams for the competition. So if you do have a high school student who you think might be interested, um, we do have a recruitment banner on our webpage. Uh, looks very similar to the one here on the slide. And there's just a form that they can fill out uh, and the library is hosting weekly meetups to help prepare teams uh, for the cybersecurity challenge. Um, they'll also get access to resources as well as workshops led by um, experts working in the field of cybersecurity. Great. Thanks, Erin. Um, so, do we have any questions or comments? I do want to say um, there's a few that I just saw on Facebook Live. Um, one person, I don't know if he's still watching, but he's an old uh, uh, classmate of mine and he said hello. So hello. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. And then somebody uh, in terms of the responding to your suggestions of covering your webcam, Erin, said, I took a baby sock, inverted the leg part and used it to cover my external camera on my computer. It's like a toque, <laughs> LOL. And then I think that it's been important. Sometimes it doesn't need to be complicated to be effective. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anybody else have any questions? Again, if you're listening from Facebook Live, just leave a comment. And anybody in WebEx, you can uh, just unmute yourself now. I just yeah. covered my webcam uh, as you were talking <laughs> about it. <laughs> the, uh, and I took three pieces of Post-it to make sure. I, Took a post it for it three to make sure it's nice and fit. 
I do have a question about the duck, duck, go. Um, yes. Yeah, that really caught my attention. I wasn't uh, aware that was available. Um, so in other words, it's a search engine just like Google and it doesn't collect Yes, so DuckDuckGo, you can also install as a browser um, that you would use in, in place of, say, Google Chrome, um, but it's also um, a search engine that you can just navigate to uh, from any browser. Okay, thank you. I have a question. For this cybersecurity for high school, should they have uh, any previous experience with, like, coding, cybersecurity, or... Other um, stuff? No, so there's no previous experience required. Uh, in fact, the, the point of the competition is really to expose um, students to this field who might otherwise have never considered it. Um, what what they will find is that cybersecurity doesn't require you to be highly technical. There's a lot of soft skills involved in cybersecurity, um, like being curious, um, attention to detail, those types of things. Um, the, the preparation um, that we do with the students through the workshops as well as other activities that we engage in in the meetup will help them gain those technical skills that they'll need for the challenge. And they, it will be during school hours or after school? So the meetups take place weekly um, at 4 p.m. Um, we have a virtual meeting place. Um, normally we meet in person, obviously, um, but during these times, we are meeting virtually with the students who are participating through Brampton Library. Um, the challenge itself is virtual as well. It's it's through a website called Pico CTF, um, and the game is sponsored by Carnegie Mellon University in the U.S. And they uh, can they uh, someone from Alberta join this? Um, someone from Alberta can join with a local organization um, so you can it's available I believe across Canada um, but you would just need to um, find a host organization so traditionally um, CanPAC has been um, for classroom environments so mostly schools um, this is the first year they have expanded it to community organizations so that's how Brampton Library got involved mm -hmm. okay thank you can I add something? Of course. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, I got stung just this past year. I was applying for a uh, passport, update my passport. And uh, so I went to Passport Canada, which I, it looked exactly like legitimate government website. And yeah. they wanted $30, which of course I sent to my card. And just to find out later that when it wasn't coming and I pursued it, that that wasn't legitimate. Um, so I did find out from that, and correct me if I'm wrong, that <clears throat> the government websites are legit when they end in .gc or .org. But it looked exactly like mm -hmm. government. Yeah. yeah, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Um, it, it's definitely, these criminals are getting more sophisticated, uh, and the websites are creating are, are almost identical to the real one. So it's really easy to be to be duped. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was speaking with them. I said, but it says right on it, Passport Canada. And, uh, I found it the hard way. Something important. Yeah, yeah it does happen. And uh, like, you, of course, you're not the only one, I'm sure, with that website and with many others. And, uh, you know, I think that the the best takeaway is to just always take a beat. Um, and that's re really good information about that. It should end in .org or .gc.ca. I think it would be gc.ca um, to just make sure that it is. Yeah, I mean, I was applying for a visa to go to another country and I was thinking, well, how do I go online and make sure that it's actually, I don't know what that government's website's actually look like so i had to do a little bit more digging to make sure that i was on a legitimate website to get to, to get my visa this was obviously not this year a couple years ago yeah. But yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah are there any other questions let me just stop sharing my screen so i can see if there's anything that i missed in the chat that was really informative thank you Great. Um, 
I've got lots of notes. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to uh, double check Facebook just to see if there's any questions there. No, I think we got them all. So um, thanks, everybody, for attending. I'm going to stop the live stream right now. Thanks, everybody, on, on Facebook for watching. And uh, if you have any questions uh, later on that were, that if you're watching this recording later, just leave a comment and we'll be sure to respond to you. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.